day, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Thank you to 2020 for having us today. We are going to talk about designing for independence and dignity. My name is Maria Stapperfenny. I am a certified master kitchen and bath designer and a certified living in place professional. I am also a practicing designer, uh, the manager of Tewksbury Kitchen and Bath in beautiful downtown Oldwick, New Jersey. Yes, it is a tiny little town, but it is lovely here. We are having a very good day, and I hope you are where all of you are too. Of course, a big thank you to our host, 2020. We appreciate you having us today, and we appreciate you being willing to help us get this fabulous message out. We all know how important education is. Being here, you not only learn, become part of a national team, but you also do receive CEU credits. So NKBA members, please do log on to nkba.org and self-report. As we all know, it is helpful to outline what we together are going to learn today from this webinar. So we're going to start with number one, understanding the need for better designs and products. Number two, the importance of collaborative teams for your clients' accessibility, comfort, and safety. Number three is design and product ideas that will change your client's world. Number four is how you can assess the client needs and make some recommendations for their home accessibility, comfort, and safety. How to sell the job. And lastly is outline your steps to success. All individuals have the right to live in their home with independence and dignity for as long as that house can accommodate their needs. I'm sure that none of you know anyone that should be uncomfortable or forced to move because their home is neither accessible nor safe. And while loss of independence and dignity are the primary reasons why most individuals move out of their home. In fact, over 300,000 Americans turn 65 every month, and about 90% of those over age 65 want to continue to live in their current home. But can they? Our current ho housing stock was pr built primarily for healthy males age 35. That's it. So existing design and products create increasing accessibility difficulty and risk of accidents, making our homes difficult to live in, either comfortably or safely. I don't know anyone who says, you know, I just can't wait until I get into that nursing home and I can chat with all of the other people in there and talk about how horrible all of our children are. There is nobody that is out there saying that, said by no one ever. And here's what happens in the 100-year life cycle of a home because we know that as design professionals or any kind of a professional that has influence over a living space, we are actually furnishing that home for its occupants. So it's why it's so important to focus on the house itself. So you can make a difference now in all homes through professional education, using these correct assessment tools, and networking for accessibility, comfort, and safety. So if we look at this really quickly, the average family will live 13 years in a home, about 20 individuals in about 100 years. So including visitors, you've got about 6,000 individuals active in that home. And out of those 6,000, about 1,000 of those individuals will be at high risk for accidents and injuries in every home. And as somebody with influence over a living space, you have the ability to make a difference today. Now I do see two hands raised. Please feel free to use the chat window if we can help you out. With so many people on our call, we're looking at about 380 people today, and it's only going to increase. Um, we had to keep our attendees muted for the moment. Now let's look at the cost of falls in our home. In 2013, the direct medical cost of falls were $34 billion with a B dollars. This is like throwing away money because many falls can be prevented. And if you think that's a lot of money, by 2018, these costs are anticipated to increase to $68 billion per year. And these are just the direct costs. 
the indirect costs of a fall are in addition to these billions and include lost productivity, impact on the family, immediate changes to your home, and the possibility of having to move into a more expensive assistive care environment. In addition to any of our own personal and preconceived perceptions, here are some common misunderstood um, misunderstandings and statistics. So I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. Denial of our own condition is natural and it's dangerous, but here's some of the things that are common. Oh, people with disabilities are all older adults. Well, we know that's certainly not true. We only have to fix home for those who need it. Well, we know that's certainly not true as well. It won't happen to me. Everybody who thinks this way which is almost everyone at this point, is now entering that great state of denial. We know that it is more than the river in Egypt. And so I'm asking you as an audience, does everyone here use an assistive device every day? Many of you do. In fact, you can't see me right now, but I have on a pair of reading glasses. Glasses are an assistive device. In fact, 75% of all adults and 25% of children all wear glasses or contact lenses. Now, yes, that's an assistive device, smaller than a wheelchair, but it is still the same idea. So now, let's look at some interesting validated statistics from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Our first box shows that one in five Americans have a disability. Fewer than 15% were born with this disability, which means that they've developed it as they've gone on in life. Now we're going to 5% of children 5 to 17 years old have disabilities. 10% of people age 18 to 64 have disabilities. And 38% of adults over age 65 have disabilities. Americans with disabilities, we're looking at about 63 million currently that have a disability and 11 million that are age six or older who need personal assistance every single day. Now, a lot of the talk is about wheelchairs, but 3.6 million Americans age 15 and over use a wheelchair. That's not a big percentage. We know that that's about 1% of the population, one out of 100. However, we know that 11.6 million Americans use some sort of a walking aid. So we're talking about the early efforts, the pioneers of home safety, but now is the time for us to move forward. Universal design was a great beginning, and anybody that is involved in a design career also understands that Design constantly evolves. It is not a static thing. So universal design was neither simple nor was it intuitive. It was a set of principles but not a business opportunity. A destination, but yet there were no specific directions on how to get there. And universal meant it really wasn't specific to your client's needs or desires. Universal, again, meant not personal. And it was often compared to ADA, or an institutional sort of a look that we know that consumers and industry rejected. And while these were sound principles, they really weren't enough. Then we moved into aging in place. Again, another great effort, but it is a limited market and doesn't fix homes for the future. Aging in place can make your clients feel that they're somehow being blamed for their age and or condition. It had a limited target market approach, didn't fix the long-term problems. Again, older adults perceive this in a negative fashion. And again, we had consumer and industry rejection of aging in place. It was a great program, but it wasn't enough. So what do we need? We need a new direction. All of the early efforts and programs, however, have built this foundation for a new program and a new direction that is a standardized program that guides us into the future, comprehensive, organized, something that's simple and intuitive, a personal and easily customizable recommending designs and products so that you can specify whether something has to be done now, soon, or in the future 
So there's always something that needs to happen and change for that home. A broad and inclusive of almost everyone beyond universal design and aging in place. It's a business opportunity and a collaboration between professional experts. Now let's talk for a few moments about the importance of collaborative teaming. No one, not anyone, single person has all the answers. There is incredible amounts of training, experience, and or licensing and certifications that are necessary for certain advisory positions in people's world. But your clients deserve the best possible team of experts, the best possible for loose solutions for their safety, and they want to be comfort comfortable in their own home. Something else that we talk about, especially in New Jersey where I am, is that we need to minimize our professional liability. When someone has a medical uh, condition, you would be expected to have as part of your professional collaborative team a medical professional, either an occupational therapist or a physical therapist that could come in and be involved with that person and their specific medical issues. And make no mistake, these people want to partner with you, the design professionals, to make sure that we collaboratively come up with great answers. Interprofessional networks is, uh, interprofessional collaboration, let me start out, is the new black. And each team member has specific experience. And only through this responsible collaboration can we really achieve this goal. Now we've put this in a pie chart for accessibility, comfort, and safety. And not that I get all OCD and I want to list them alphabetically, but I do put accessibility first and safety last. Because without these bookends, your client can never ever feel comfortable. So let's talk about accessibility for a moment. Accessibility is the ability of a home to allow these individuals to enter, move around in the house, and function comfortably and safety. It's safely. Well, the experts here are those occupational and physical therapists because they are responsible for understanding how the human body interacts with designs and products in the home and work with these other team members to help create these standards that will ensure that they are accessible for your clients. Comfort is how well the individuals perceive, accept, and value home design and products. Well, the experts here for this part of the collaborative team are your design professionals and contractors. They are responsible for blending these standards of safety with beauty and comfort so the consumer and the industry will accept this. And the last one is safety. How well this home actually complies with the standards set by the accessibility and comfort team members. And this is where your other team members can come in, home inspectors, child proofers. Actually, one of the co-founders of the Living in Place Institute is Louis Delaware. He is a certified child proofer. He has published several books on the subject, and people contact him from all over the world to do consultations on child proofing their spaces. These are the people that are responsible for monitoring compliance with safety standards and practices created by that entire team and generating those recommendations. And we've all heard that collaboration is, you know, quote unquote, the newest thing. It's here. It's already here. I already told you that it is the new black. Because only through proper collaboration with the proper team experts assures you that your recommendations are the very best solutions for that individual. It minimizes their risk and your liability. Because we are talking about safety, and we've got one shot to get it right. Let's move into design and product ideas that will change your client's world and hopefully yours. So I want to spend a few minutes doing this. Is your job selling independence and dignity? Or is your job selling design and product recommendations that allow your clients to gain their own independence and dignity? And how you do it without talking about it? Tell stories. People are relational and they want to relate to a story. Not everybody wants to be told what to do, but they can relate to a story or 
um, something that has happened to you or somebody that you know, whether you've actually experienced this firsthand or whether you've sort of geared that story to help that client achieve a better understanding. These are some questions from a standardized assessment tool that is available to CLIP graduates that they can use when they go into a home to ensure that they are consistent in their evaluation of interior and exterior spaces. So I'm going to whip through these slides pretty quickly, not spending more than just a few seconds on each one. But if you look at them, you can see some of the check marks that are up there. Um, one of the things I'd like to bring your attention to is the second checklist that says, wall outlet center minimum 24 inches above the floor. Well, we all know that that's not what builders do. If you leave that electrician and the builder alone, they will put those outlets at 18 inches above the floor. Well, why is that? The answer is because that's what they've always done. Well, we are going to specify something that is more accessible, comfortable, and safe. Why should you have to bend all the way down to your ankles to put that plug in or not? It doesn't make sense. Wall switches at 44 inches above the floor ensure that every client has the ability to be able to reach them, whether they are standing or whether they are in a seated position. One of my favorite, favorite things, and if you take away any gold nugget from this presentation, please look down at the second to last one, a GFCI outlet behind every toilet. I just recently told a client this, and she said, oh, so I can plug in my iPad. And of course, I said, absolutely. Now, you and I both know that's not what I meant at all. I meant so that as she wants to stay there, because every design professional asks, how long do you want to live in your home? And I've never heard someone say to me, until I decide to move into that assisted living facility or until I can't anymore. But I have had people tell me they're taking me out in the box or they're taking me out feet first. Those things, I'm sure anyone that has asked that question has heard those answers. So now it is up to us to provide solutions that allow them to truly do that. That GFCI outlet behind the toilet is fine, but for a night light. So that, again, you tell the story so that the grandchildren can see when they come and visit, so that your friends feel comfortable when they're not in their own bathrooms, they're in a stranger space. Or for a USB charger when you're sitting there having, you know, quality time with your iPad. Here's another question. Are high contrasting colors used to easily identify, or are they confusing? Some of these floors look very confusing to me. That one in the center, oh boy, that's actually a library overseas. I don't think I could do that without being too awake. And the winner of the psychedelic stair contest, you'll see on the far right. Sometimes contrasting color can be dangerous. High contrast coloring in flooring will make those spaces darker, and it's called vertical cliffing, and it will make those spaces appear to be lower. Sometimes there are people with cognitive or developmental disabilities, and they do not want them to leave the rooms, and one of the tricks that are used frequently is to put a darker colored floor mat in front of the door to keep those people away from that space. Color, however, can be useful. Um, the opposite of the psychedelic stair winning contest is on the upper right where you can see that a contrasting wood color does allow you to more easily see the edges of those stair treads through your peripheral vision. Handrails, these beautiful horizontal lines in a shower are actually giving perspective. On the bottom you see the light rail. That light rail is called a horizon line same in the shower, and it does help people that have vertigo, and several people develop vertigo as they get older. So if you're doing those designs, please keep doing them. Children that are quote unquote on the spectrum, they get into those shower rooms and the steam and things like that can sometimes impair your visibility. Also, clients that wear glasses, I don't know anyone that wears their glasses into the shower. So you are looking at people that are in the shower frequently that have compromised vision, and this does help with balance. Is a grab bar positioned above the tub, the bathtub, or shower controller? 
you have the ability to specify that that controller can be something that, again, is not where your plumber would want to put it underneath that shower head, but it is accessible to that client before they actually enter the space so that they don't have to put their hand potentially under some scalding water in order to decrease the temperature of that water. You are looking at, <clears throat> forgive my voice, it's an allergy thing. You are looking at a grab bar in that picture, and as long as you do use the proper fasteners, that grab bar can be a wonderful safety feature without looking institutional. I learned in that clip, that Certified Living in Place professional class, how important it is to use the right products and to not screw grab bars into the studs. When they said, and where do you put the grab bars? It was my first, I was the first hand up in the air thinking I knew it all and said, oh, you screw it into the studs, at which I was promptly had my hand slapped and was corrected. I do work in a lumber yard, so I should know better. I've looked at piles of studs every day for decades now. And you and I both know from looking at those studs, they are not perfect. They are not without splits. They are not without knots. They are not without holes. None of them are perfect. And if they are behind the wall, there is no way any engineer in their right mind would ever certify that grab bar being put into, quote, unquote, the stud because they do not know the quality of that stud behind the wall and cannot verify that it doesn't have a crack, a split, any number of those things. But if you use the right fasteners that are shown on the bottom left-hand side of this screen, you can go right through the sheetrock, and these wall anchors that are shown on the bottom left are both engineered to hold 250 pounds in drywall and they only cost between 10 and 15 dollars so they are very easy ways to make your client very safe in their home without having to look institutional this class covers all ages and i know some of you are geared more towards that baby boomer with that more dispensable income and wanting to remodel their home perhaps they're empty nesting and enjoying that home space now that's all their own but something else is child proofers we talked about that earlier briefly they may be an important part of your team visit the sites that are listed here and learn more about collaborating with child proofers every trade professional does have its own professional association so you can do that do you know that every two weeks a child dies from a television falling over? This is a dreadful statistic. And yet over 90% of all children's injuries are preventable with proper home safety. And here you see those straps that are anti-tip. Please, if you see them, ensure that people have installed them and installed them properly. There are some other things that we can do to make people more comfortable. Raise gardening beds so that people can feel active, have purpose, and yet not have to bend all the way down to the ground, ground level. Ramps are difficult to calculate. There's no two ways about it. The class I took gave me this simple formula. It's right here, and now I know that three steps need 45 lineal feet for this ramp. Recessed area rugs create a tripping hazard or um, I'm sorry, recessed area rugs actually eliminate it, but can be a challenge to install. The picture on the right shows what you should do with throw rugs. That is Living in Place co-founder Eric Listu on NBC television, and he is showing you what to do with them. Throw them away. And yes, in case you're wondering, every December he and his wife put on red suits and bring smiles to thousands of children of all ages. So here's some valuable information for all of you from the National Kitchen and Bath Association about the dimensions in a kitchen and the criteria about what is minimum. Now minimum is just that, a minimum recommendation. Obviously, we always hope for more space. And I think so do your clients. Here's some other slides. Are the controls for all of these large, easy to see, easily accessible? And again, we talk about some of those freestanding ranges 
where the controls are all the way up in the back. And yes, I understand from some people that have told me, well, that's so children can't reach them. But then that means that you, the adult, especially me and my vertical shrimpiness, um, are putting our hands over potentially scalding um, pots and pans to be able to turn those controls off. So please do consider that things can and should be easy to clean with that lovely easy surface and induction cooking. If you haven't experienced it, might I recommend you go to your favorite appliance place and ask them for instruction about induction cooktops, how clean they are, how sleek and easy to use, how professional they are, how energy efficient they are, and they're a great thing for living in place because it is not accidental that someone can leave it on and have a dangerous situation. Here's some examples creating areas to set items down when there is insufficient counter space nearby. We know that not, uh, not every kitchen gives us the optimal space to be able to put things down, and here's some creative solutions, and I'm sure many of you know of others. The countertop edges, do they have a contrasting color to help with visibility? And again, through some people that have um, visual issues, they can only see better through their peripheral vision. The countertop actually on the right is a metal edging that is sprayed applied metal. And what's interesting about that is there are no edges to trap the debris. So it's a very clean way to give that metal edge. What about the sheen of our countertops? We know that for so many people, especially in that baby boomer market, they have dreamed of owning that granite kitchen countertop or that new quartz countertop. But veiling reflection and dangerous glare those light of the reflection off of that surface causes a loss of contrast and visual discomfort, and sometimes it can cause a blinding after image. So we want to make sure that when someone is going to spend as many years as they can in that house, we allow them to do that by giving them lower reflective surfaces so that they don't have that beautiful task lighting under their cabinets and then are squinting from that blinding glare that comes back to their face. The hardware, do they have C or D pulls or push to open mechanisms so that fingers don't get caught in a knob or handles that will catch those clothes. I understand that we all know that right now many of our manufacturers tell us that the most popular cabinet is the white painted shaker look. And what is the most popular hardware? That long steel bar pull that has those finials on the end. But think about the fact that you don't want those to be pocket grabbers, which is what I tend to call them, where they grab at your clothes and they pull at them or they rip your your, your closets and actually, or your clothes. And when people get older, remember that their skin gets thinner, so they will bruise more easily and cut quicker than they would when their skin is younger. Beaded stair lifts. Well, we do know that we also want more space in hallways and more space and width in our stairwells when we have the option to make that recommendation to our consumers. Why do we want more room? Well, we don't tell them it's necessarily for a stair lift. That's also not the reason we tell them that they should have the outlets at the top and the bottom of the stairs. Of course, the story we tell is that it is wonderful to have it there so that they have an easier way to plug in the vacuum when they're vacuuming the stairs or cleaning the stairs. But how convenient is it that if they should ever need a lift in later years, that the outlet is right there and convenient and comfortable? Also, the wider stairs, it's not so that they have the room for the stair lift. Again, the story that we could tell, or any version of it, is that if you're carrying a sleeping child up the stairs, you don't want to have to go up sideways or uncomfortably or carrying that laundry basket up. So I hope that you're seeing the ways that you can talk about these things and getting these consumers to accept your recommendations without having to quote unquote talk about it. Structural concerns, especially for individuals over 250 pounds, and we're categorizing that as persons of size. 
So we want to make sure that when we mount products into the walls or ceilings that they're going to hold that weight required. And sometimes that may require extra installation methods and work to prevent the failure. And if you're not sure, always consult that structural engineer that is part of your professional collaborative team. Again, you've got one shot to get safety right. Your sink, bathtub, and shower faucets, are they easy to reach? And again, preventing slipping or bending. We see some beautiful um, grab bars mounted in this shower. However, with the proper fasteners and diameter, that handheld slide bar could have also been a grab bar. Because when somebody's going down, they're going to grab for anything that they can. And I want you to note the horizontal tile line for reference and proximity to that wall. Also remember that as we talk about these things, that sometimes as people get older, it's not necessarily for them, but we also need that room for caregivers. We would like those hallways to be a minimum of 44 inches wide and stairs 44 to 48 inches wide. Thank you, Michael, for your question. All faucets and shower controls, are they single lever? It is thought that this is more sanitary than faucet knobs. Dirty hands touch the bottom as they lift it to turn it on, and they tap the top with clean hands to turn it off. In class I took, we also learned the names of the products and their costs. Now if you have that client that is OCD, remember that there are also touch faucets and touch less faucets because you are designing for everyone. These are sanitary, they're convenient. My mom has osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and fibromyalgia. I can't tell you the amount of times I have seen her grab a spatula and whack at her faucet to turn it on and or off. So I did get her a touch faucet so she can just take her forearm and touch the top of her faucet to turn it on or off. She refuses to not be active in her kitchen, but this is a way that we can all help her live safely, accessible, and much more comfortably. Can you see inside the cabinets and drawers? Many of you have seen these sort of lit cabinets when you go to trade shows, but why not include them and incorporate them into your jobs or your clients' home designs to make visibility inside those cabinets easier? You're working so hard to give them accessibility to the contents that let's not forget about the visual element. What do you notice that's different from lever handles that you're probably familiar with? the returns, the side returns on all of these things. Um, if a person leans on a lever handle, they could slip and cause a fall. So that return gives them a little bit of extra grip so that their hand doesn't fall off. And it also can stop from being that, that pocket grabber that we talked about, or grabbing your clothes or your purse or something else from catching. Something else that's another wonderful thing, Interior passage doors swing out from the room. Now I know that most of these should be done for the powder room. The powder rooms especially. Now everybody's going, oh, but the powder room is accessible to the hallway. I don't really want the door to swing out there. It's a traffic pattern. It's a major traffic area. Then consider a barn door or a sliding door or a pocket door because powder rooms are typically one of the smallest baths of the home, but it is the one on the main level and somebody that has mobility issues is going to use that particular bathroom. If something should happen and they fall in that room, emergency services cannot access that person. If the door swings in, they're going to be whacking that person with the door, potentially causing even a greater injury just to get to them. So that is something for you to think about and consider. Are all entry and passage doors wide enough? Most homes have 30-inch wide doors, but again, we're not going to tell people we want you to have them because you may be in a wheelchair someday. And ADA, which again is required commercially and institutionally, but not residentially, recommends a clear opening of 32, but we as Living in Place are recommending 36-inch wide door openings. 
doors across from one another make navigation easier, and the frame minimums of 18 to 24 inches away from adjacent walls can make that approach easier for you, whether you are seated or standing. Somebody else, I think Michael asked about the hallway or the stairs, but here's hallways. Hallways wide enough for comfortable passage, again, person carrying a child, or you could say using a wheelchair, what about a walker? Again, we want a minimum width of 44 inches, which would allow a 36-inch wide door that we talked about earlier to swing out from the room. Stairways and pathways. Consider recessed lights. And I love this bottom left photo where they've added LED strips. They rabbited out the bottom of that handrail and put those LED strip lights so that whether you're going up the stairs or down the stairs, the light is not shining into your eyes. I thought that was brilliant. Also, please consider the switches and the outlets and the cover plates. Are they easy to see? Colors and contrasting. Again, people in their bedrooms, not necessarily with their glasses on. So these are all things worth considering. Let's move into the next section, which is how to assess client needs and make recommendations so that you can have this home accessible, comfortable, and safe. Use an electronic checklist. Make the best possible designs and product recommendations. And as you go through these questions, prioritize these as to whether someone needs to do it right now, immediately, whether they need to do it soon, or whether they need to do it in the future, because eventually all of these things need to happen. We do want those hallways to be widened. If someone doesn't have those mobility issues, maybe that's not a now thing, maybe it's a soon thing. So you are actually creating work for yourself by providing that person with what needs to be done now. They will call you back when it's something soon or in the future. And again, choose only the areas you want to review and minimize your client risks and your liability. Again, the equipment needed for that um, home accessibility, safety, and assessment tool works with Apple iPads. And again, this is something that as a certified living in place professional, should you choose to take that next step, um, you have the ability to subscribe to this. And it works with tablets. It has, you should have a rear-facing camera so you can look at the screen. And the tablet screen should be at least 8 inches so that you can use your documents and notes for viewing. These are some screenshots from that to set up your report. Choose some of the areas that you're going to assess. These are all prompts that will come up in that app. And here you can see that we've chosen general home safety on this slide. There's a question at the top of the screen. Is there an emergency contact name and number programmed into everyone's cell phone? So if not, that's something that needs to be done now. And you can add a photo, add a voice note, add some notes on this tool, recommend when the work should be done, recommend that trade professional, add your photos, and add your notes. So you can go ahead and take a photo of something and add all kinds of drawings to it add your client's signature, and go ahead and send that report right to the web. This app is called the HASAC, and HASAC is an acronym for Home Accessibility and Safety Assessment Checklist. And that's the name of the app again, HASAC, H-A-S-A-C. Thanks, Shelley. So you again choose the reports that you want to choose, what's now, what's soon, what's future, and what's the full report. And you can go ahead and email each one of these to your professional collaborative team using the questions, when, the notes, the photos, and go ahead and send it right on. So there's five different reports created with this should you choose to do it. And you have the report full with medical issues. And again, remember that if we're talking about medical issues, which could be specific to your client, they should only be used by a licensed medical practitioner with the client signed HIPAA release. When you present these assessments to your client, show those now, soon, and future reports separately. Review it with them, and remember not to share medically sensitive information, again, without that HIPAA release. You can go ahead and send these out 
to the rest of your collaborative team an email when there's any kind of special sensitive report. So that's a way to be able to do that. It really is easy to use because all you need to do is just answer a list of questions. But wait, there's a little bit more. Now you get to sell the job and stay in business. So here's some key marketing and business components that you have to know to make that sale. How the value of your designation and any certifications that you possess. How to identify your products and services. Understand why you're offering that service. Identify your market segment. Gain a knowledge of that buying process. Analyze what you can charge for your products and services and how to increase your business opportunities. Very few clients are going to want to talk about their physical needs. In fact, most deny that they need any help. Oh, no, no, I don't need that. That's what they'll say. But remember the slide earlier where we learned that almost 20% of our country has a disability and that 75% of us use an assistive device, you know, again, those glasses that we talked about? Most of your clients, you're going to need to tell these stories, like I've been sort of interjecting, about what they really need. And these are ways to do it without talking about it. So you say something like, Dad, you need to replace that towel bar in your bathroom with a grab bar so that when your friends come to visit, they can use that and help prevent a fall. So again, we're talking about the fact that most people we know will not do it for themselves, but they will do it for their friends, they will do it for their relatives, they will do it for their visitors. If you install a no-step shower now, your mom is going to be able to stay longer. Well, for somebody that can be good or not so great. Everyone is using no-touch faucets. Don't worry about it. It's great. Everybody's using them now. Another way to get somebody to do that. Or most new bathrooms have a nightlight behind the toilet. It's just a wonderful safety feature, and you don't have to turn on that room light and wake yourself up in the middle of the night should you have to get up. It's a great way to sell that one additional outlet behind the toilet, which is wonderful. In fact, I never let a client put in a new bathroom without calling out an outlet behind the toilet. And I hope that after this webinar, none of you will allow that to ever happen again, and everyone will have an outlet behind the toilet. So let's move on to your next steps to success. Let me give you three simple steps for you to take. These steps are going to help all of your clients gain the independence and dignity they deserve without talking about it. So are you ready to be part of the solution? Here we go. The first one is Make a commitment to be a problem solver, okay? I know all of you are going to be ready to do that. Step number two, all of the organizations that you see here are asking to be a part of your interprofessional collaborative team. Designers, the NKBA, ASID, IIDA, IDC, the medical community, the American Occupational Therapy Association, the American Society of Home Inspectors, Home Builders, Remodelers, Architects, and this list goes on. Okay, are you ready to learn more and take the education course that are approved by all of these associations? Check that box. Next, are you ready to create your own collaborative team to help you solve these problems? Wonderful. Now I can see some great business opportunities are starting right now, and there's only one more step for your success. Are you ready to make all of your projects accessible, comfortable, and safe for everyone? Awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate that, and congratulations to all of you, because you're now ready to move forward with your business and your professional team and make everyone's lives better now, soon, and in the future, remembering that 100-year life cycle of a home for 6,000 people that will walk through that door. So takeaways from this presentation, just in review, 
we talked about the understanding and the need for better designs and products, the importance of interprofessional networks for accessibility, comfort, and safety, designs and product ideas that will change yours and hopefully your clients' worlds, how you can assess client needs and make recommendations for home accessibility, comfort, and safety, how to sell that job, and we've outlined your steps for success. And I appreciate all of you for coming here and your interest in wanting to make your clients' home safety. A big thank you to 2020 for having us here today. I'm going to stay on the line a few more moments to answer any questions that you may have, and I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much for coming.